Welcome to the videos discussing monotonicity of a function. It turns out that monotonicity refers to increasing and decreasing behavior of your function. Let's look at a graph because again I'm highly visual and uh, I think this is easy to see graphically and then we'll take it over into the analytic aspect of things. So we're just looking at a portion of this function in the plane, this blue function. We can clearly see that looking from the left to the right we always look and describe behavior of, of a function looking from the left to the right. So looking at this function from the left to the right, we can clearly see that over this domain interval, it appears that the function is decreasing. Its outputs are getting lower and lower and lower over that interval, and over this interval, it appears the function is increasing. Again, we always have to look from the left to the right. So we would say that this function is decreasing from 0 to, let's say it happens at 2, it's hard to tell for sure, and increasing from 2 to 4. In order to rigorously discuss what it means for a function to be increasing or decreasing, or to talk about monotonicity, which is what it's the catch-all term for increasing and decreasing behavior, the monotonicity of the function, I want to define it very succinctly and very clearly. So let's look at the definition of increasing, decreasing, and what it means for a function to be strictly monotonic. Let f be defined on an interval i, and it can be open, closed, or neither, and we'll talk more specifically about that later. We say that f is an increasing function on that interval i if for every pair of numbers x1 and x2 in the interval where x1 is to the left of x2, in other words on all parts of this, we are looking from the left to the right. That's just a way of saying we always look from the left to the right. When we talk about x sub 1 being less than x sub 2, our input values are looking from the left to the right. A function is increasing if the output values for the first input value x sub 1, there we would say that's f of x sub 1, if the output values have this relationship, and we're going to say that's f of x sub 2. And on the y-axis real number line, then this would be, this one is greater than that one, right? And that, so that's what we're saying here, looking from the left to the right, where x sub 1 is less than x sub 2. The output on the left input value is smaller than the output on the right input value. And that is the definition of increasing. Now, let's pick up a different color. Let's do the same thing here. The function is decreasing on the interval if for every pair of numbers x1 and x2 in the interval with this same relationship, x1 is less than x2. If the output at f of x sub 1 is greater than the output at f of x sub 2, then we have a decreasing function. We say the function is strictly monotonic on the interval if it is either increasing only or decreasing only on the entire interval. So what I have drawn here in green and blue would be strictly monotonic. In other words, they're showing or evidencing only one type of monotonicity over the entire interval. Now, one thing I want to kind of talk about this kind of open, closed, or neither thing, and, and this is a little nuance, but I want to make sure that you understand this. We're fixing to find intervals over which a function is increasing and or decreasing. When we give our intervals, we usually give just the x coordinates. We would say from x sub 1 to x sub 2, we might, you know, have increasing or we might have decreasing, whichever. I uh, want to just talk about the differences in notation. This is an open interval. This is a closed interval. Here, endpoints are not included, right? And here, endpoints are included. Well, mathematicians, even contemporary mathematicians of our day, don't agree 
on which one of these notations is correct when you're talking about monotonicity. Some of them say that you can include the endpoints. You can talk about being increasing at x sub 1 or decreasing at x sub 2. Many of them don't agree, and many of them don't agree because we can clearly see here that it requires two points in order to talk about increasing or decreasing. It's a comparison. You have to compare outputs, and based on the result of those, either less than or greater than, then you can talk about monotonicity or increasing or decreasing. So many mathematicians say that the endpoints, just one point in the plane, should not be included when you're talking about increasing or decreasing. Because if I gave you just this one point, and I said, are, is, is f increasing or decreasing at that point? Well, according to most definitions, mathematically, you got to have a second point for a comparison. So most mathematicians, I really shouldn't say most, I don't know that that's true. Some mathematicians don't believe endpoints should be included. Really, mathematically, there isn't a standard for that. For us, we're not going to include endpoints. When we talk about where a function is increasing or decreasing, or we talk about the monotonicity of a function, when we give our answer, you know, here's the interval over which the function is increasing, we're not going to use brackets. We're going to use parentheses only. And I know I kind of went, you know, way deep in there, but I always have some students that are curious as to why the endpoints aren't included. And frankly, it's, it's not incorrect to leave them in or throw them out. It's, a, it's an ongoing argument that mathematicians still have to this day. So it's not always convenient to draw the graph of a function to determine if it's increasing or decreasing or neither. We saw it's very easy if you have the graph to look at. Sometimes technology can fail us. You know, the algorithms that our calculator uses are not always 100% accurate. They just plot a few points and connect them with a smooth curve and you know, what if it's wrong? So what we're going to do in order to find the intervals over which our function is increasing or decreasing, or to determine the monotonicity of our function, is we're going to go look at the attributes of the first derivative. We're going to look at what the first derivative tells us about our function, and then we don't need to look at the graph. Now I'm going to show you graphically, but we can back it up analytically. All right, so recall the first derivative f prime gives us the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f at the point x. So all of the tangent lines here and here and here and here, all of those slopes are negative. Every single one of those slopes are negative, and every single one of these slopes on the tangent line are positive. So, and right here, we know right in between those two, we had a point, an input value, where our derivative had to equal zero. So it turns out for us that monotonicity can be found using the sign of the derivative. using the sign of the first derivative, particularly. So that's what we're going to do. If they give us a function and they say, find the interval over which this function is increasing, we're going to analytically find the interval over which our function has a derivative that's positive. If they want to know the interval where it's decreasing, we're going to find where the derivative is negative. So we're going to use slope of the tangent line to tell us about where our function is increasing and decreasing. So here's what we said a while ago. If the first derivative is negative, the slope of the tangent line must be negative. And therefore, the function is decreasing. Any tangent line we draw along a curve that's decreasing is going to have a negative slope. So all we need to find out where a function is decreasing is to find out where the slope of the tangent line is negative. Anywhere that we're looking for an increasing interval, we're going to look for where the slope of the tangent line is positive because we are guaranteed that when a function is increasing, 
the tangent line slope will be positive. And the changeover, the endpoints of those intervals are for us usually going to be where the derivative is number one undefined or number two where the derivative equals zero. So that's what we're going to use to find increasing and decreasing behavior on our function. The sign of the first derivative is going to tell us where our function is increasing or where our function is decreasing. So here's the monotonicity theorem. Let f be continuous on an interval i and differentiable at every interior point of i. It has to be smooth and continuous on that interval i in order for us to use the derivative. If it's not differentiable on that interval, then we can't use the derivative over the entire interval. So if f prime is positive for all x interior to the interval i, then f has to be increasing on that entire interval. And if f prime is negative, then f has to be decreasing on that interval. This theorem allows us to precisely determine where a function is increasing and where it's decreasing. And it's just a matter of solving two inequalities. Now this is what I want your work to look like. What's actually on the slide here is a little different than what I want your work to look like. So I'm going to be writing this down and then we're going to ignore what's on the slide. But let's say we were given an example like this. If f of x is 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 12x plus 7, find where f is increasing and where it's decreasing. Again, I'm all about the process, so here's the process for finding that. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the derivative function. That's the first thing as an AP reader I expect to see a student do on a question like this. So let's go back up to our function. Let's find the first derivative. 6x squared minus 6x minus 12. There's our derivative function. The next thing I would expect to see a student do is set it equal to zero. Well, why, when we're only concerned about where it's positive or negative? Well, where does positive and negative change? If we're going to have our function outputs, here's our y outputs, if we're going to go from positive to negative outputs, there was only one way to get there, and that was to go through zero. So we're going to determine where our function equals zero. Here I'm going to factor out uh, 6. I have, I'm going to divide both sides by 6, so that goes away. I have a quadratic equation. I'm going to factor that. This is how we solve algebraically correctly for zeros. And I have a 2 and a 1. And I have more negative than I do positive. Now, I have two things multiplied together. Remember, if I have a times b equals 0, then that means a equals 0 or b equals 0. So that's what I'm going to do here is set each one of these linear factors equal to 0. And I'm clearly going to show the AP reader what I'm doing. So either x equals 2 or x equals negative 1 when my derivative equals 0. Well, why is that important? Well, here's how I'm going to answer this question. I'm going to draw a table. And this is exactly what I want your work to look like. I'm going to label my table. I'm going to label this column t period, p period. That stands for test points. Test points. I'll, def I'll tell you what that means here in a minute. Test points. This is going to be f prime of x, or the sign of my function that I'm after. I'm going to come out here to the side, and I'm going to make up rows based on how many zeros I have. I have two zeros, so I have drawn two lines out here, and I'm listing them from smallest to largest. So I know that this is where my first derivative equals zero. Now I'm going to get test points on either side of the real number line, and it doesn't matter what points I pick, your points might be different than mine. And I'm going to plug those test points into my derivative and see what sign I get. That's all that's going to be in this column is signs. Uh, I better stop here and pick up on the next video. Look for that second video.